episode of season one of Theory of Flight. We're finally going to do it this time. We're going to figure out how a wing creates such an amazing lift to drag ratio. So I've created an animation for you. And here it is. Once again, the blue square represents the air, and the red is the wing. Notice this is a cambered airfoil, and the secret is in the shape. Wings tend to have a fairly flat bottom, as you can see, and a curved upper surface, as you can see. Now, if we make the wing invisible for a minute, we're not going to take it away. We're just going to make it invisible. The white represents that perfect vacuum. It's the same that we were talking about with the ball. You've got a perfect vacuum there that the wing is going to fly out of. So we bring the wing back into view, and we move the wing forward out of the vacuum and we see that that vacuum forms behind the wing but unlike a ball the strategic shape of the wing is such that that vacuum forms on one side of the airplane on the bottom there's no vacuum the pressure on the bottom remains normal atmospheric pressure we've got a vacuum above the wing but notice that the vacuum is predominantly on the back half of the wing. So at this point, we're predicting that the aerodynamic force is going to form towards the back half of the wing. Now what does Bernoulli's principle have to do with this? They're always talking about Bernoulli's principle. And so far with this explanation, there's no Bernoulli's principle involved here. Now if I superimpose a picture of a Venturi over this, in order to make a Venturi, it would have to be a pretty darn long, skinny Venturi, wouldn't it? And based on what we learned about how Venturis work, what's your sense of how effective this Venturi is going to be? I think we're going to predict this is not going to be very effective at all. So in this case, we're going to predict, sure, there'll be a little bit of Bernoulli's principle involved here. There's going to be a little bit of acceleration of the air around the nose of this wing and a little bit of reduction in pressure but it's going to be pretty minimal. So at small angles of attack such as shown here most of the lift is just that pure aerodynamic force and that lift is going to be concentrated towards the rear of the wing. Scientists express this by saying that the center of pressure is well back towards the trailing edge of the wing at small angles of attack. But let's start over again. Let's put the wing back, no vacuum. Let's rotate it to a greater angle of attack and see what happens if we move it forward now. Now as we move it forward, right off the bat we see a bigger low pressure area. That vacuum is more intense. We definitely are going to predict a stronger aerodynamic force at this larger angle of attack. And the air, of course, is rushing in to fill that from all directions. And I, I just mentioned that here because, of course, the air is flowing in from above and it's flowing in from behind. And you might want to keep that in mind because in Series 4 of, uh, of the Theory of Flight, if we ever get to Season number 4, we're actually going to talk about the stall. And that becomes very important, but it's premature to talk about that right now. Now, if we superimpose a Venturi over the wing in this case, okay, now we're talking, right? Now it's starting to look more like a Venturi. So there's going to be much more acceleration of the air around the leading edge of the wing due to that Bernoulli's principle. And the pressure then is going to decrease much more around the, the nose of this wing at the greater angles of attack. That means that the locus of our aerodynamic force is going to shift forward. Scientists express that too is by saying that at greater angles of attack, the center of pressure shifts forward. You may have heard that before. Now you can see why it's logically necessary. It follows logically from our theory of flight. OK, so you can also see here that while the aerodynamic force gets uh, stronger at the larger angles of attack. It is likely to be rotated back somewhat, so 
the lift to drag ratio is not going to be as excellent as it was at the smaller angles of attack. So there's going to be some angle of attack here where we get the optimum lift to drag ratio. Now remember, that means we put our, our uh, xy axis on here that uh, the optimum lift to drag ratio is when that aerodynamic force is steepest, closest to the y-axis. Not necessarily when it's the longest. As we increase the angle of attack, the aerodynamic force will become greater, so it becomes longer, but it tends to rotate back. As we keep increasing the angle of attack, the aerodynamic force gets greater and greater and greater. At some point, though, it reaches its maximum lift. When we rotate beyond that, uh, we get the stall. And that's going to take up all of season number four, as I said. Just a little tidbit of information right now. A lot of people tell me, oh yeah, when the wing stalls, it just kind of stops working. No, no. What's happening when the wing stalls is just that the aerodynamic force is beginning to rotate back around. Your airplane is starting to go back towards being a rock. But anyway, it's a, there's a little bit more to it than that. So uh, hang in there for season number four. Okay, so at this point, we've reached the end of season number one. And we learned a lot. We, we started off by learning the problems with the standard explanation of lift. We then worked our way through. We learned about the kinetic theory of gas. And once we had that kinetic theory of gas in hand, everything was just logical steps after that. We learned how the aerodynamic force forms due to that perfect vacuum. We learned about Bernoulli's principle, how it amplifies or multiplies the pressure when the air is forced to flow around a restricted area like the sides of the ball or the nose of a wing. And we see now that the way a wing works is all about its strategic shape. Uh, it's such that the aerodynamic force forms on one side and not on the other. So it's highly asymmetric without the need to spin the wing the way we had to spin a ball to get left. Uh, the wing is just that perfect shape to make an optimum lift to drag ratio. And of course, scientists earn their living every day optimizing that shape to get even better lift to drag ratios. Okay, so next season, I have planned for you uh, an entirely new topic. And the topic is pitch control. You may be thinking, how can you spend an entire season on something as simple as pitch control? Well, a few episodes ago, you would have said, how could I spend an entire sim uh, season on something as simple as lift? Trust me, there's a great deal of misconceptions about pitch control, and it will take an entire season to get through and, uh, and completely understand how the elevators are used to control an airplane. So I hope to see you again next season. There is, however, an epilogue to this season. Because there are some people out there who are going to say, well, your explanation sounded really good, Ray, but I know it's wrong. You know how I know it's wrong? Because you never mentioned Newton's third law once. You talked about the first law. You talked about the second law. But you never mentioned the third law. And you can't explain how an airplane flies without talking about the third law. Well, people who believe that are what I like to call wrong. But be that as it may, I have created an epilogue where we're going to deal with the question of what does Newton's third law have to do with the way an airplane flies? So if you're interested in that, come on back for the epilogue. Otherwise, at this point, you pretty much can say that you know how the air holds an airplane up in the air. And next season, we'll start to learn how to fly it. So I hope I'll see you again next season. Until then, I'm Ray Preston, and this is Theory of Flight.